Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear members of the CL community and the distinguished representatives of the Universidad del uh, Rosario and Externado de Colombia. Uh, we are very lucky to be here and I'm very much grateful to both of the organizers of the CL committee for including me into the program and having the unique opportunity to actually introduce the keynote remarks of Professor Gatti. Uh, what I will do is actually, I will just try to first introduce Professor Gatti, who obviously needs no extensive introduction. But then I will also try to perhaps give some, a couple of quotations from his book that he edited lastly, and he's going to talk about today. And a couple of recent works that he has you know, worked previously on mainly the Global South issues, the inequalities in the society, including, of course, in international economic law. And I think coming from a developing country, uh, being a WTO chairholder representing uh, Istanbul Big University, I think it has been a great decision. So I'm, again, grateful to the SEAL organizers and the executive committee for choosing me as one academic who is representing a developing country and introducing a professor who is very well versed into the issues on the problems related to global uh, South and North issues. I would like to first begin by a short CV of Professor Gatti. Professor Gatti is a professor of law and Wing Tat Lee Chair in International Law at Loyola University Chicago School of Law. A graduate of the University of Nairobi, Kenya and Harvard Law School, Professor Gatti sits on the board of editors of the American Journal of International Law the Journal of African Law, and the Journal of International Trade Law and Policy, and on the advisory board of the International Journal of Constitutional Law, among others. He is also a founding editor of Acronomics Law, a blog on international economic law issues as they relate to Africa and the Global South and the African Journal of International Economic Law. His research and teaching interests lie in public international law, international trade law, world world approaches to international law, which is in short swale, comparative constitutionalism and human rights, as well as business law. He is an independent expert on the working group on extractive industries, environment and human rights violations in Africa formed by the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. He is also an expert member of the Working Group on Agricultural Land Investment Contracts of the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law, which is in short, as we know, UNIDWA. He has sat as an arbitrator in international commercial arbitrations hosted by the Permanent Court of Arbitration. He is an elected member of the International Academy of International Law. He has consulted for the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, OHCR and the Economic Commission for Africa, ICA, among others. He is widely published in the areas of public international law, international trade law, international human rights, and speaks extensively on these topics, both in the United States and abroad. Professor Gatti's lecture today pertains to his latest work on how to reform the global debt and financial architecture. The book edited by Professor Gatti contains 12 chapters that advocate for overhauling the current ad hoc restructuring process, which according to Professor Gatti is dominated by the former colonial powers and which again only minimally represents the interests of the African countries. Let me borrow a quote from Professor Gatti's introductory remarks to the book to further illustrate the approach that this book and the contributing authors generally take. This book brings together African voices on reforming the global debt and financial architecture convened by the African Sovereign Debt Justice Network. The global debt and financial architecture is a colonial legacy established when the most debt vulnerable countries in Asia and Africa were not at the table. Africa's 55 countries are therefore underrepresented in the governance structures of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, where they have a meager 6.1% of the voting rights. The IMF sits at the helm of the global debt and financial architecture. Its governance system established by its articles of agreement is based on weighted voting. Professor Gatti and the other contributors in the book take the view that when the votes of the permanent members of the Paris Club are added to the weight shares of major countries of the IMF, it is quite clear that the poorest economies of the world have no influence at the IMF. 
since the approval of Paris Club members is necessary before the commencement of any renegotiation of a sovereign debt, the subordination of indebted countries is etched into the architecture of the global debt and financial architecture. Since Professor Gatti will provide us with an in-depth analysis of his approach in this book together with the contributors, I would like to conclude by borrowing yet another quote from his work together with Sergio Putti, where the authors argue, and I quote from their uh, article together, the disenchantment with the current international economic order is real and is not new, the problems lie deep. We need an inclusive and legitimate way to eliminate the inequities built within the global economic order. Resolving these structural issues will require unprecedented reforms that make international economic law more equitable and democratic and address its racist origins. For that reason, we depart from the proposal in David Sloss's introduction to this book uh, to the extent it is predicated on preserving a rules-based international order that is consistent with liberal democratic values. We propose instead a deeper engagement with the legacies of colonial dispossession and post-colonial exploitation of the global South that lie at the heart of the current global economic order. That deeper engagement can provide a foundation for a more profound and progressive transformation of international economic law. With this, I will conclude my introductory remarks. I will give the floor to Professor Gatti, but I would like to say that, of course, I will be mindful of the time and Professor Gatti kindly accepted to take the Q&A time at the end. I hope that we will have enough time to receive your questions and entertain, uh, by, you know, entertain by Professor Gatti all the questions that you may have in this very challenging topic. Professor Gatti, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pinar, for uh, that very kind introduction. Um, and I'm really delighted to be here. It's a true honor to have been invited by CL to uh, give these remarks. Uh, it's very hard to say no to my friend, uh, Wazy. Um, uh, so um, uh, this is um, a true honor. It's also great to be at the University in the Global South. Um, it's a beautiful campus. I walked up, and uh, uh, it's a it's a really uh, magnificent uh, uh, facility. Um, um, I also want to thank CL for the support of the African Network, uh, the African Network on International Economic Law. Uh, its support has been indispensable and uh, 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 very valued, uh, and I hope that uh, we can continue working uh, together. Um, so, uh, and the last sort of introductory thing I wanted to say is that uh, my thinking on uh, what I'll, I'm going to talk about today uh, has been influenced by um, a group of researchers we've been working together with uh, the Africa Sovereign Debt Justice Network. I see uh, Professor Kinkube is there. Uh, I wonder which version of Kinkube is in this room because I know there are more than one of him. Uh, it's been wonderful collaborating with this group of researchers uh, who, uh, as Dr. Minar said, uh, uh, wrote all the chapters. I just wrote the introduction to, uh, to that book that she just mentioned. Um, so uh, today I want to think aloud about sovereign debt distress. I'll be about um, 40 minutes or less, maybe even less than that. Um, so I want to think about this era of sovereign debt distress with a historical lens. Um, I thought about approaches to international law passed on. So history is central to everything uh, that uh, I, I do. Um, and I do so uh, without assuming, as you already had, um, uh, that, uh, that existing institutional and disciplinary solutions uh, uh, provide a way out of this distress. Overwhelmingly, sovereign indebtedness uh, in the global south is traced to basically uh, what the World Bank says. Let me just read uh, from the World Bank. Uh, it's a symptom of deeper structural and institutional weaknesses in developing country economies. It's sort of the typical story about um, how indebtedness was created, 
mostly sort of going back to um, excessive borrowing, especially after the OPEC oil crisis with lots of petrodollars uh, going around the world and uh, the uh, and uh, stories like the, the fact that the absolute uh, theory of uh, uh, sovereign immunity um, uh, uh, disappeared, increasing capital flows and all that. So I wanna set that story aside um, uh, today. Instead, I want to demonstrate two things, um, given my larger historical uh, context uh, in talking about the financial subordination of indebted countries. Um, so that's the past claim. You know, we have to go back to a little history, and I, 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 I will um, sort of spend quite some time today doing that. Secondly, this lecture also makes another uh, equally important claim. That is that structures of economic domination, such as those of uh, financial subordination, are inseparably connected to ratio domination. There's simply no way to understand finance capital without its deep and abiding connections with race. Um, so I will, in this lecture, proceed as follows. In the first part of the lecture, I will trace the use of financial supervisory mechanisms by public and private creditors from Europe and the United States of indebted countries like Bulgaria, Macedonia, and other countries in the Balkans that were regarded as the Congo of Europe. So emphasis on the Congo of Europe. Um, so this, this historical period for both this example and the next one is late 19th century and early 20th century. The second part of the lecture will focus on Liberia. In doing so, I hope to retell how the world's second black republic experienced financial subordination that came with the types of financial supervisory mechanisms imported from the US, uh, US's experience in Central America. I will devote some time to also discuss Liberia's very famous 1926 loan. Uh, I don't know how many people know about this loan. This was a loan that was borrowed uh, to facilitate Firestone's investment in Liberia's uh, rubber plantations uh, uh, in that country. And in doing so, uh, I'll devote some time to a debate between uh, W.E. Du Bois and Marcus Gavi, who wrote contemporaneously about uh, the loan controversy. Uh, so they, they were writing in real time. So I'm not citing uh, people who sort of thought about it uh, later on. In fact, uh, W.E. Du Bois had been hired by the U.S. government to go and help uh, Liberia, uh, the first Black Republic, uh, to negotiate uh, this loan, among many other things. Um, so before finalizing the lecture, uh, and if there's time, I also want to say a little bit, um, borrowing from a great book by Peter James Hudson, um, uh, uh, How uh, Bankers and Empire, How uh, Wall Street, uh, colonize the Caribbean. Okay, so in this past part of the lecture, I want to focus on these financial supervisory mechanisms uh, that were used in the late 19th and early 20th century to discipline and to plunder. And the basic, one of the basic takeaways from this historical period is that the kinds of extensive encroachments on the financial sovereignty of today's most indebted country, e eco economies are far from new or novel. Jamie Martin's recent book, The Meddlers, Sovereignty, Empire, and the Birth of Global Economic Governance, discusses a series of examples of such extensive encroachments in Europe in the early part of the 20th century. His book discusses how the indebtedness of Central and Eastern European as well as Balkan states in that period involved an extensive legacy of external control over their assets and budgets in exchange for loans. Although the League of Nations was established with limited authority of economies of its members, it established an economic committee to oversee the implementation of its ambiguous mandate a mandate to ensure equitable treatment of commerce. That's all the league mandates say, to ensure equitable treatment of commerce among its members. But subsequently, the league uh, financial committee developed powers to reach into the domestic economic realms of select member states. J.B. Martin refers to the emergence of the league's powers to reach into the domestic policies of some of the members as a truly radical innovation. This is true, but uh, as I will show in this lecture, the financial subordination of indebted countries by interest of global capital predate the league period. 
What is clear though, and I'm in entire agreement with Jamie Martin, is that the League of Nations Financial Committee was given an inch and it took a whole mile and more. The League of Nations justified those powers on account of the fact that, fi the financials, that financial stability more, than, uh, more so than any issues of trade poses a strategic liability to some of the leagues of nations, uh, most powerful countries. Heavily indebted countries during the League of Nations period were regarded as failed states. This in turn justified the League assuming as one of its past tasks to oversee financial stabilization uh, by giving financial stabilization loans to these failed states. These are all sort of, uh, these are not my words. These are the words used by officials of the League of Nations in this period. And I hope they're ringing true to you because these are terms that are still used today in the context of sovereign debt and many other issues. These laws were accompanied by strict conditions and external control of a borrower's domestic policies concerning currency, imports, exports, taxation, everything. The League of Nations conditional loans uh, in this uh, period were therefore a prelude to today's practices of conditional lending. Some of the countries receiving these loans were regarded as sort of the weaker European countries, uh, which uh, in turn meant that were subjected to these strict foreign economic controls. A strategy of the League of Nations financial reconstruction interventions was to insulate officials of the League from domestic opposition as budgets were cut and civil servants dismissed. As international economic lawyers, we're very familiar with the story of insulating uh, um, international institutions from domestic politics. Uh, if you think about the Bretton Woods institutions, they have non-political um, clauses in their constitutive agreements. Uh, on the non-political mandate, uh, sort of it's a classic thing uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, started long uh, before the, uh, the Bretton Woods institutions. Um, so I wanna focus on uh, Bulgaria and I do so quite intentionally. Um, in the 1880s, uh, the then newly independent Bulgaria was heavily indebted to creditors from Britain, Australia and Germany. Prior to its independence as part of the Ottoman Empire, Bulgaria had experienced dealing with external creditors. For example, prior to its independence from the Ottoman Empire, Bulgaria was on the hook for repayments when the Ottoman government defaulted on its external debts in 1875. When the Ottoman government agreed to settle these debts through the Ottoman Public Debt Administration established in 1881, the agreement allowed the, uh, that OPDA, the Ottoman Public Debt Administration, an entirely private body of primarily European bondholders to take control of the Ottoman Empire's revenue, including tobacco, stamp, salt revenues, customs duties, revenues on, of patents, as well as the contributions of areas formerly under Ottoman control, uh, such as Bulgaria. The Ottoman government had only one representative in the OPDA, and that represent, representative's voice was limited to merely having a consultative voice. Um, what the OPDA experience shows, the Ottoman Public Debt Administration shows, is how creditors seek to ensure indebted sovereigns have prime revenues as a reliable and regular uh, type of insurance in the event of default. And I'm going back to this history in part because everything that I, I found going back to this history is everything that we've been working on as the Africa Sovereign Debt Justice Network. We have these things uh, on our website, on, on our blog, Economics Law, where we monitor uh, what's happening with the debt uh, situation of various African countries. And I can tell you, uh, it's history basically repeating itself. All these stories are not stories of yesterday. These are stories that are happening contemporaneously as we speak. I mean, of course, therefore today that role is played by uh, the International Monetary Fund that conditions debt uh, on assurances that governments will raise enough revenue for debt repayments they'll, and that they will cut public spending, among other things. Uh, further, like today's indebted sovereigns, the Ottoman government was using new loans to pay outstanding loans. Uh, further, European creditors were willing to continue lending the Ottoman Empire, even when it was heavily uh, uh, indebted, thereby trapping the Ottoman Empire into a vicious cycle of debt. Then it reminds me of work like Susan George's work uh, about how the global debt and financial system is resembles a casino, but I digress. Let me go back to the OPDA. So the OPDA is regarded as an important prelude not only to increased European capital flows, the Ottoman Empire, but also to European imperialism within Europe. 
uh, or at least within continent, the continent of Europe. This led me to think of how scholars such as Bupinda Chimney have demonstrated very authoritatively the development, how the development of rules of international law in the early 19th and uh, uh, 20th centuries was causally linked to the development of capitalism. For scholars like Chimney and Anthony Angi, the rise of rules of international law cannot be dissociated from how these rules were crafted to safeguard the interests of global capital through mechanisms of dispossession and exploitation, as well as to justify the imposition on financially weaker countries. So, and my emphasis here, it's not just European, non-European, global capital did not make those boundaries, although it used, as I will show, uh, 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 racist discourse, or to be more specific, racialization, as I will call it. For 12 scholars, that were approaches to international, well, the growth of capitalism was closely related to the production of difference, as it was with enforcing stem, sameness, standardization, and homogenization. Restated another way, a racialized standard of civilization has been a central component of the creation and subsequent maintenance of imperial economic and racial hierarchies in international law. In fact, some recent work persuasively argues that empires cannot can be understood as machines for organizing debt and indebtedness. As my example from the Americas in about the same time period will show, uh, towards the end of this lecture, the end of the 19th century was a period of increasing financial integration as lenders from Europe and North America entered into debt relations with countries that needed funds for needs such as infrastructure, industrialization, as well as consolidating the position of elites within these states. So um, I can say more about Bulgaria. I have many uh, examples of what happened there. But I, my goal in discussing Bulgaria's experience with bondholders in the early part of the 20th century serves at least two purposes. First, to show how financial supervisory mechanisms both, uh, by both public and private creditors from Europe and the United States were imposed over indebted countries in the periphery of the global economy. My point is not so much to trace the origins of these external controls over indebted countries, as I've said, but rather to indicate their pervasive views in the past. As I will demonstrate in my second example below, this Bulgarian example also helps to emphasize how foreign financial controls over non-European countries by uh, creditors, Western creditors and countries it, uh, long predated, as I've already said, the League of Nations period. Second and most importantly, really, I'm interested in exposing the role that race and identity played in understanding how indebtedness in countries like Bulgaria at the periphery of Europe was understood. As Bulgaria epically struggled with its indebtedness together with other Balkan states like Macedonia, it was referred to as the black sheep of Europe or the Congo of Europe. These references clearly showed how European elites such as the British liberals of the period were mobilizing images of backwardness and blackness to amplify how dangerous the indebtedness and ungovernability of Bulgaria, Macedonia, and other countries in the Balkans was. These European elites argued in favor of securing the stability of uh, uh, the stability and orderly governance of the Balkans. While British efforts in Africa were aimed at halting the safe trade, Macedonian peasants were often depicted as an enslaved population. Uh, while British liberals of the period felt it their duty to bring civilization and progress to the Congo and to stop the slave trade, they also wanted to bring self-governance to Macedonia and other Balkan states, which in their view needed rescuing from Islamic influence and Turkish rule. They were basically pretty racist, but not just racist because they, they um, uh, um, and, uh, you know, my talk is full of quotes, so a lot of these are quotes, uh, but also because this is part of what I'm calling racialization, how racial difference is mobilized to justify the uh, financial supervisory mechanisms. Um, and I'm using Europe very intentionally because we twillers are often blamed as sort of, you know, focusing on North, South, you know, European, non-European, but this is entirely within Europe. And of course, as, as, as we all know, Europe is certainly very diverse, just like Africa is. Uh, but I'm doing this very, uh, very intentionally. Uh, very provocatively, hopefully. Um, for these liberals, to quote uh, someone else, the Balkans constituted an oriental, um, 
tyranny on the highways of European commerce and culture. Uh, well, it's unwise to draw parallels between the designation of the Balkans as the Congo of Europe to the ways in which non-European countries were pathologized in colonial Orientalist discourses. It's important to reflect for a moment why the Balkans were thought as the Congo of Europe. Um, and I can say a lot about that. Um, but I'll pause here just for a second. Um, and so it sort of reminds me a lot about the discussions uh, Dr. Aturan about Turkey's desire to join the European Union. And, and no more need be said about that. Um, and so just to push this point further, um, this racialization point, the use of terms such as the Congo of Europe um, or the black ship of Europe um, is part and parcel of a racialization process reflected in lender borrower relationships. The key point I want to draw, borrowing especially from Marxist scholars like Robert Knox and Ruth Wilson Gilmore, is how processes and discourses of racialization are the ones I'm discussing here, together with supervisory mechanisms of indebted countries, impose disproportionate cost of participating in an increasingly monetized and profit-driven world on those who have been racialized. Key to this idea of racialization or production of tropes of risky borrowers, populations, and countries is seeing race not through a biological or cultural lens or just as the, uh, through the lens of interpersonal discrimination, um, but rather as an organizing principle of social stratification, extraction, and expropriation. So let me go to Liberia. Um, so I really got very intrigued uh, uh, with the story about Liberia and Firestone uh, going to invest in the rubber plantations there. Uh, uh, for a number of reasons, not least, you know, you know, so it's the sort of the commercial reasons that Firestone was going to uh, Liberia. Uh, the Europeans were clamping down on rubber supply from their Asian uh, plantations. Uh, uh, Ford Motor Company was uh, creating lots of cars and, and uh, Ford himself was uh, banging the doors of the White House, uh, trying to figure out where rubber supply would come from for the tires for these new cars. I mean, this is a really fascinating story. Those people at the very, very center of um, uh, that period uh, uh, really had uh, had tough problems to resolve. But another reason I was very intrigued was when I realized that contemporaneously, as this was happening, the US government figured the best strategy is to hire W.E.B. Du Bois uh, to go uh, and negotiate on behalf of Firestone with the American Liberians in Liberia. And I found that very fascinating. And what is really even more fascinating is that uh, the Ali Du Bois, as I'll be saying in a minute, was very hopeful about what Firestone could do for Liberia. He was especially hopeful. And he really pushed on behalf of Firestone. He actually visited uh, Liberia with the Firestone executives. Um, uh, um, and, um, and so this is a really wonderful story uh, uh, from my vantage point. Now, Cedric Robinson writes about the second Du Bois, the Du Bois that emerges in the 1930s, who becomes radicalized because he, his hopeful moment in the 20s uh, dissipates very quickly by the 1930s when he becomes super radicalized because everything that he'd hoped that Firestone would do for Liberia was falling apart. Um, and so just to quote from Robinson, he attributes the eventual awakening or consciousness of middle-class black intellectuals like Du Bois to the crisis of capitalism experienced, especially in the Great Depression. Uh, according to Cedric Robinson, Du Bois's radicalization led him and a generation of black radicals to their realization that their black petite bourgeoisie classes uh, political and historical vision was responsible was responsive to only one uh, was responsive to only one racial con consciousness, white suprem white superiority. That's quoting directly from um, Cedric Robinson. 
So in short, Du Bois had in his initial support for Firestone failed to see that Liberia was for all intents and purposes, a virtual protectorate of the United States. Liberia was very much like Cuba, Panama, the Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, and Haiti, which were all subject to numerous supervisory mechanisms and of course blockades in the period over the economies as a result of indebtedness to the United States, as well as their political dependence on the United States. Um, so I want to, um, before ending, uh, uh, say a little more about uh, Liberia and its experience with uh, private creditors, uh, because it parallels very much all the examples from Europe that I was talking about uh, a minute ago. Um, and the United States preferred the United uh, uh, Liberia to remain an independent Black Republic uh, and intentionally refused to, um, uh, to make it a protectorate, even though the Europeans were like, but this is what you, you control everything there. Why are you pretending that it's not a protectorate? Just, be, just, just name it. Uh, but uh, the United States uh, refused. Um, and there's another second reason, as you uh, 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 know um, in a minute, why I think Liberia is, a, is an important example in the context of um, uh, the uh, remarks that I am making. So the United States um, was of course working with American bankers. Uh, they appointed a customs receivership in Liberia that also functioned as a financial advisor together with auditors from the United States who are responsible for making periodic reports and inspections. And this is very similar to also what happens, as I just said, in places like the Dominican Republic, where the United States had established customs receipts um, uh, to be paid to uh, a, a US receiver under the Roosevelt Colliery, um, effectively having fiscal control over the Dominican Republic, and, uh, including on the collection and distribution of its customs revenue while reserving the right of military intervention if they didn't pay. Um, and as Robert Knox also says in the context of Haiti, even raiding the central bank, the gold in the central bank uh, uh, using uh, armed force. Um, this model of dollar diplomacy involved establishing loan receivership agreements that uh, were extended uh, under President Taft's administration to Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, and other countries. Um, and, uh, and so this I found really very fascinating um, uh, parallels uh, with, uh, with what is happening uh, today. Uh, and there, were very, there are a number of agreements, I'll not go through all of them. Um, uh, I just wanna focus briefly on the 1926 loan agreement uh, that Liberia borrows to facilitate uh, Firestone's uh, rubber plantation. Um, this was uh, a five, I mean, this was a $5 million loan um, uh, that uh, uh, included um, uh, supervision uh, by uh, a financial advisor uh, who was responsible for collecting all of Liberia's revenue and an auditor who gave prior approval to all expenditures. You know, I remember when I was a student at the University of Nairobi, somebody said to me, do you know that the, there's an IMF official who sits in the treasury in uh, Nairobi? I was like, how could that be possible? Um, but it's true, you know, that the, the analogies uh, of uh, the period I'm talking about are playing out uh, in real time around the world as we talk about uh, the, uh, uh, the debt distress uh, that many of these countries are facing. But before ending with a few uh, concluding remarks, uh, it would be incomplete, uh, my discussion of Liberia would be incomplete without a discussion of another black intellectual of the period, Marcus Gavi. So um, Marcus Gavi had his back to Africa movement with Liberia as a key destination. Um, and he disagreed with Du Bois, uh, with Du Bois's early preference. Uh, for what he called white capital for Liberia's rubber plantations. Gavi, the leader of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, uh, said, you know, my association is going to provide this loan. You know, why not take a loan from us? We're going to raise the money. Um, and uh, what is key to Marcus Gavi's views is that 
uh, his views on multinational investors uh, in agriculture were forged out of his own personal experience working for the United Fruit Company as an Afro-descendant immigrant in Costa Rica. Gavi traveled across Panama, right here, Colombia, and other Central American countries along the Caribbean coast, witnessing the ill treatment of Afro-descendant and other non-white workers by banana corporations. Gavi, unlike Du Bois, therefore had a personal experience of the exploitation of black labor, and therefore about how racial inequalities were built in the white structures of capitalism, as he called them. This experience in turn informed his vision of the return to Africa movement uh, and the fact that he preferred to mobilize black rather than white capital to fund Liberia's rubber plantations. From Gavi's perspective, Du Bois and Liberia had surrendered an independent black state to the white capitalists of Firestone. Gavi offered, of course, to raise these funds. Uh, the, Liberians and, the Liberian elites rejected Gavi's proposal, arguing that it would drive out white people out of Africa at a time when many European economic interests were vying for a former foothold to extract wealth out of Africa. Uh, uh, and this really proves one of Gavi's insights about how white capital uh, snared local elites who then acted against the interests uh, of their own people. Gavi's critique of white supremacy, and in particular its economic domination over black peoples, was concerned with racial emancipation and equality. And equality. Gavi's in linked racial domination in the United States, imperial rule in Africa and the Caribbean. Um, and as I already mentioned, Du Bois did ultimately revise his initial optimism. Uh, um, and uh, the 1930s uh, Du Bois was a much different uh, Du Bois, who then began to see the segregated workforce of white management and black labor uh, that was no different from other extractive industries that the European colonization of Africa had built. Um, so let me conclude with some uh, thoughts about the implications of the examples I've outlined above. First, I want to emphasize how race, or more precisely what I've called racialization, justified in Firestone's investment in Liberia. This racialization is a key part of how the loan transactions and financial supervisory powers were designed. In Liberia, Firestone invoked images of lawlessness and chaos in ways that justified the use of the American state to pretend over the Liberians, especially the indigenous Liberians whose political, economic, and social practices were seen as inferior and in need of civilization. Yet from my examples, racialization was not restricted to Liberia. It was projected through the racist idea of the Congo of Europe to Bulgaria, Macedonia, and other parts of geographic Europe. In the Liberian context, these discourses of inferiority form formalized racially coded and unequal relationships between white capital and the United States on the one hand and Liberians on the other. These unequal relationships were also built on the presumption on presumptions that the financial supervisory powers and rules that came with the loans from white capital were a superior antidote to distressed, debt distressed or backward economies. The economic advantage of the United States and its investors like Firestone were therefore based on a, a teleology that frames the economic, um, economic advantage as resting on its presumed superior intellectual, political, economic, and social practices. Finally, on this point, my examples demonstrated that this tele teleology was uh, not restricted along a black-white paradigm, as my example from the Balkans and the former Ottoman Empire showed. This racialization is a pervasive feature that invariably accompanies extractive and subordinating logics of sovereign debt wherever they occur. Second, as my examples in this lecture have hopefully demonstrated, if you're still awake, uh, busy, these accounts of the superiority and inevitability of Western ideas about what constitutes good economic governance are built on the erasure of the violent history of European imperialism, of conquest, of slavery, of genocide, land and resource expropriation, and the trope of civilization that claimed um, uh, that claimed uh, that, of course, the West was uh, superior and uh, the, the rest was were inferior. Uh, third and finally, as international economic lawyers, we have to look beyond the many layers of the technical and doctrinal sophistications and the accompanying mystifications if we are to fully lay bare the basic issues and stakes involved in foreign, in sovereign debt. By demystifying the doctrinal policy and technical underpinnings of sovereign debt contracts, indentures, and other complex debt instruments, and I'm very interested in that, 
uh, we can begin to appreciate how these instrument, instruments embed and are embedded in histories and institutions that subordinated some at the expense of others, including along axes such as, but not limited to race, class, and gender. And just to emphasize this point by invoking yet another of my inspirations, I follow and agree with Christopher Gibbers when he argues that we have to do more to examine how structures of racial and economic domination are not only connected, but how they are uh, inextric inextric inextricably linked and inseparable. So um, both historically and theoretically, more work in my view needs to be done uh, drawing links between structures and histories of racial domination on the one hand, and those of economic domination, such as the mechanisms of financial subordination I've discussed. Um, and you know, um, uh, in a recent volume that uh, I saw uh, Captain Cousin here, that the Journal of International Economic Law invited us with Nina Suvala, we edited uh, a volume on racial capitalism and international economic law. Uh, and that's not even a drop in the ocean, much more needs to be done. Um, and perhaps we need to collaborate with political economists uh, like uh, Ilya Salami, uh, who are doing really fantastic work uh, on this question about the mobilization of racialized difference and coloniality uh, in the context of uh, uh, financial subordination. Uh, and asking these types of question, in my view, opens up new and important types of questions that we often don't ask. For example, why should indebtedness be understood only or merely, merely from a contractual perspective or framework? What about the climate debt owed to developing countries that are suffering the brunt of, uh, of the damage caused, especially by the by especially large contributions to climate crisis by developed countries? What about reparations for historical injustices such as slavery and colonialism? Why aren't we asking those questions? They matter. I don't think that the contract is the only way to think about debt. There are more ways to think about debt than the contract. So we as international economic lawyers have to do more of this kind of probing because doing so, in my view, is a key precondition, not merely for alternative or subalternate points of view, like well, but for a more just, inclusive, and equitable international economic order. And if these reasons don't convince you, since maybe uh, like me, you do a lot of trade or international investment law, um, you might want to remember that uh, uh, by far debt is uh, the most important source of wealth creation and of course oppression than perhaps global trade uh, in monetary and value terms. So many thanks for your attention uh, and I look forward to the discussion. whether this is working i hope it's working well thank you very much professor gatti i mean this was truly impressive especially again you know coming from turkey but my past is ottoman empire i had no idea that ottoman empire had such practices so it was eye opening so very much interesting i would like to now open the floor for questions we have 15 minutes and uh yeah i see hands i see first professor gao and then perhaps yes over there and i see leila shukrun and over there okay so we have 15 minutes i'll take care of the time please go ahead thank you uh james for the total force which uh, took us uh, through all these uh, difficult periods in history now uh um, just in response to your quote about uh, the congo of europe uh, i think uh, you might be delighted to know that the uk nowadays aspires to be the Singapore on pants, you know? So hope that gives you some comfort. Uh, but uh, a more serious question is uh, regarding China. You know, since China is now uh, providing so much financial assistance to the developing world, I wonder uh, whether you could discuss, you know, how the Chinese rules are different from the old rules set by Europe and the US and how this is going to change uh, international economic law. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gathi. Um, of course, Franz Fernand reminds you about uh, how we people from the third world still uh, defend the ideas of the global north. And just to say that it doesn't matter that people from the global south are in these international bodies. My question is the following. We had a few weeks ago the 10th conference in Paris about 
international debt, at the end, there was no agreement. Some countries like us are saying, uh, why don't you forgive part of the debt and then we won't proceed to exploit minerals and of course oil. So I would like to know your thoughts about this conference in Paris and the proposals from Global South countries like Colombia. Thank you. Uh, I will also uh, echo what others have said, James and Fuera Tour de Force. Uh, thank you for this wonderful lecture. Um, I, so I wanted to ask more, or ask you to to say a little bit more, if you would, about the the public and the private dimensions here. Uh, you mentioned that both public creditors and private creditors are involved in this uh, scheme, so to speak. And, and yet we're seeing, of course, more push for sort of ESG on the private side. At the same time, though, there are calls for legislation to, to stop private lenders from um, blocking debt relief agreements. So it seems like there's a bit of a disconnect there. I would welcome your thoughts on that. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Professor Getty, for this fascinating presentation, which in a way counterbalances very nicely the sort of very political politically correct discussion we've just had on climate change this morning, uh, in which most of the global south was, was ignored. It's also very relevant because uh, you may have seen yesterday the UN Secretary General tweeted about sovereign debt and said that well, more than 3 billion people are living in countries which pay more to refund the debt than they give to education or health, for instance. So my question, and I'm building upon what Catherine just said, my question has to do with cooperation. So how can we talk about climate change? How can we talk about debt when we know actually the sort of elephant in the room cooperation? So what sort of you know, role and how would you integrate private entities and indeed uh, cooperation into this picture? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I let me just begin by saying I don't have all the answers. I'm very good at asking questions. <laughs> I'm not very good at uh, answering uh, questions. You know about uh, China. I know there's been a bit, Professor Gao, as you know, um, you know whether China is lending differently. You know, let me just say two quick things about it. First, I think uh, there's been some um, there's been some. Uh, some suggestion that uh, the China lens opaquely. Um, uh, but I don't think that that is true because uh, almost all uh, almost all external loans, I'm trying to phrase this very clearly, um, are written in contracts and indentures that are highly confidential that are privy, whether it's for private creditors or bilateral lenders, uh, these contracts are simply not uh, available widely. So in that respect, you know, I disagree with some of the, the stuff that's been going around suggesting that actually uh, China's debt is much more thick. Secondly, uh, then, and I think just to answer your question straight on, I think China is acting like all the other hegemons in the context of debt. And it, it, in fact, um, uh, on contingent debt, hidden debt, um, you know, this is where I think that, uh, you know, China may be uh, behaving uh, very differently than other lenders because, uh, for example, the lending um, uh, to Angola on condition that Angola exports oil to, uh, to, to, to China, uh, those kind of resource exchange deals for debt, you know, are some of the most uh, untransparent uh, and in the book that um, um, that Dr. Atran mentioned, there's a wonderful chapter uh, about a particular project in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I mean, the book is freely available on economics law, uh, sort of uh, discussing those types of deals. So I don't think China is behaving very differently. I think it's behaving just like all the other creditors um, uh, in the history, in the brief history that I have uh, told. That, you know, they are lending, of course, much more for infrastructure, for example, than other things. Uh, but in my view, they are not uh, very different. The other thing I wanted to say is in the context of um, some of the restructuring that's going on under the common framework, uh, China has also uh, been criticized for moving a little too slowly. But as we've just seen with the restructuring with respect to Zambia, uh, 
um, uh, um, uh, it was the bilateral, it was the, it was the Paris club that moved faster than the private creditors. There's no private creditor deal with respect to, to Zambia. So this is just to say the picture is a little different. I, I think that uh, China did uh, very well under the DSSI, the debt suspension initiative uh, that ended at the end of last year. Uh, and I think some people say it burnt its fingers and therefore it's moving slowly with these other restructurings. But I think China is not behaving any differently than any other creditors, um, um, except the US certainly wants to play this up as part of the geopolitical game in Africa. And if you've been following our blog, we've been following step by step, you know, the visits, for example, in Zambia, the same week, the um, head of the IMF, uh, these, Secretary of the Treasury Secretary from the United States, uh, um, uh, a big minister from China, you know, so, you know, um, the geopolitics is, is there. Now, the 10th conference on debt in Paris and proposals from global South countries. Um, as I came to Bogota, we are editing a volume on climate finance and debt from a global South perspective uh, with African scholars, with young African scholars. It's going to be released on the sidelines of the meeting uh, the, the climate meeting in Nairobi in September. So look out for that. We're going to make it really available. The one, the chapters are wonderful um, by young researchers not taking any assumptions about uh, many of the green deals we're hearing and things like that. So watch out for that. It's uh, it's going to make, um, in my view, uh, a contribution to the discussion from um, at least our part of the global south. Um, on the um, and, uh, you know, in relation to this question about, you know, proposals for solutions, we often don't hear much about debt cancellation, for example, and this, or this goes to Kathleen's point. But when the big countries want debt cancellation, it happens. Let me give you two quick examples. One, after the U.S. illegally invaded Iraq, uh, the U.S. sent uh, former Secretary of State Baker to negotiate a deal to cancel all of Iraq's debt. And the very day that the entire debt was canceled by uh, a resolution of the Security Council, the United States president at the time issued an executive order barring any enforcement action against any Iraqi assets in the United States arising as a result of the cancellation of that debt. That's one example. Another example is um, after uh, Germany's defeat in the first Second World War uh, in 1953, the London Debt Agreement effectively forgave all of Germany's debt. And some people argue this is exactly why Germany was able to recover as quickly as it was to become the industrial power that um, uh, that it is today. So. Um, when the world wants to do, the big countries want to do this, they do it, but they don't want to cancel debt for the most climate vulnerable poor countries who, as we had, they are spending, you know, an enormous amount of their monthly budget to pay external debt. A few weeks ago, the Kenyan government did not have money to pay their civil servants uh, because of the amount of external debt they had to pay. Um, so um, right now in Nairobi, there are protests going on as I speak. Uh, arising uh, uh, out of, like there was in Colombia not too long ago, uh, uh, as a result of the amount of money that is being spent uh, on uh, servicing uh, private, uh, I mean, uh, debt. Um, on um, the public-private, and I'll say something also about the uh, Kathleen question about the public-private. Um, as I was reading all this stuff from, especially the period of, uh, late 19th century and early 20th century. And I've been reading this for other projects that I've been uh, researching um, on. It strikes me that uh, the arguments we make, at least in the United States, um, about uh, the government being separate from private capital are entirely mistaken. They're entirely mistaken. The US government is centrally, the US treasury has been centrally involved for, for more than a century in the finance space in a way that undermines any argument that, that there's a public-private distinction. And it's not just about dollar diplomacy of the period. 
even to date, uh, uh, all the restructuring frameworks uh, that are going on through the, um, the IMF, they have to meet the U.S.'s approval because the U.S. has an absolute veto in the, in the IMF. The U.S., um, and nothing can happen in the IMF without the U.S.'s approval because of the weighted voting system that Dr. Acheron uh, read about. Uh, to make any change that is going to be substantive within the IMF, you require uh, an 80 percent threshold vote. The U.S. Uh, uh, has uh, the vote share. Um, 85 percent uh, is the is the threshold for any fundamental changes. The U.S. has 17 point something percent of the voting share. So the U.S. has an effective veto. Even this year, when they discuss you know, whether they're going to change the voting, uh, uh, the weighted voting formula, because, you know, the economies like China that now have much more economic weight, it's not going to be possible because um, unless it meets the U.S.'s approval, it's not going to happen. So, you know, another part of my research, as Dr. Atheran was saying, is sort of showing how the rules entrench those, this history, the rules centrally entrench this history that we are living at the moment. And there's just no way we can escape this history. And it's not just a history of the rules, it's a racist history. It's a very deeply racist history. And there's just simply no way to, to see it otherwise. And I challenge anyone to, to show me that it's not about race. It's not just about the rules, it's about race. Race is a central organizing feature of the global economic system. Um, about private creditors, I can say more uh, about private creditors. You know, I spend a lot of time on the Africa Sovereign Debt Justice Network, monitoring uh, private creditors. You know, private creditors are very insulated. There's this group in Washington, DC, uh, the, the, um, I forget the acronym right now. Um, but they're really very powerful. I mean, they're the ones that uh, when they call the treasury, the US treasury, they pick up their calls. You know, that's how all this debt restructuring stuff is happening behind the scenes. And I think that we have to talk transparently about the power of private capital. There's just no way to go around it. Just simply no way. Sorry, I went on too long and I was ranting. I think the chief would like to ask a question if you don't mind, and then we are out of time. Okay, okay. Yeah. I don't know if I can answer kids' question. I, I didn't know I was gonna get the last word or the last question. Um, but in effect, I wanted to say something about the issue of indebtedness, mm -hmm. not just as a finance issue. Mm -hmm. So we had a discussion or, or a roundtable on industrial policy on the first day yeah. of the conference. And um, I didn't get an opportunity to get my question in at, at that point. But I spoke to Mark Wu afterwards and I said to him, whereas um, a lot of the focus on the panel was on the WTO and the way in which WTO rules restrict industrial policy in developing countries, I indicated to Mark or suggested to him that if you look at the role of the IMF and the World Bank through the issue of managing debt, that they are, those rules and regulations are far more restrictive on industrial policy in developing countries than the WTO. Often the WTO is put up as the, the boogeyman, but there are other institutions that are play a critical role. And so when you have a uh, the closure of fiscal space. It means you have the closure of policy space. And in the emerging context of increased indebtedness in the post-COVID context, we're going to find it increasingly difficult for developing countries and least developed countries to respond to the climate action requirements because of indebtedness. And then also the closure of policy space in relation to that debt coming from the, the finance institution. So I just wanted to show that out there to, to add to the, to the debate. Thank you very much. And I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This concludes the keynote lecture by Professor Gatti. Please join me in giving a Thank you very much. It's brilliant, thank you.